which was a show that deserved so much better. While I'm not a fan of how often people will try and pit it against its contemporary Winx Club, Magical Girl Solidarity for Life, I've always felt like Witch was killed before its time, and that perhaps if it had released in the 2010s, well, actually, Disney's treatment of the Owl House convinces me that they just hate having good shows. They're just like, ugh, stop liking this. Why? Why do you like good things? But it's clear there were plans for a season three, specifically with that weird moment in the season two finale with a man, Mr. R, also known as Mr. Riddle, taking interest in a glamour spell the Guardians created while fighting in downtown Heatherfield. Look at that. The flat screen? Yeah. Wouldn't mind having that baby in my living room. Cool cartoon, too. Cool cartoon. And his associate, Raphael Silla, quickly becoming a computer instructor at their school shortly thereafter. I'd like to introduce you to our new computer instructor. This is Professor Raphael Silla. And I'm looking forward to getting to know all five of you. Yeah, that's totally not suspicious. Doesn't have any ulterior motives whatsoever. Just ignore the 70s serial killer vibes he's given off. Most of you likely know this already, especially if you watched my old Witch Deserved Better video from before I knew how to use a microphone. Good God, how did it take me seven years? Actually, I'm gonna be real. While recording this, I've been testing my new microphone and a new boom arm I just got, and I'm very tired. I don't know if this sounds great. I'm kind of having an identity crisis and imposter syndrome, so be graceful in the comments, please. I hate myself today. Even when you're self-employed, a Monday is a Monday. But anyway, most of you likely know that Witch originally began as an Italian comic series and was later adapted into a TV series. The comics went on for 11 story arcs, but seem to decay in quality as they go on from my own reading, as well as this great video by Laws Talks, I hope I said that right, where she ranks all the comic arcs from worst to best, along with summaries of all the comic arcs by Digital Bloodlines. The show only adapted the first two arcs and made massive changes in order to translate the story into an episodic, temporally locked medium. Thus, Mr. R and Scylla are actually antagonists from the third story arc, a crisis on both worlds. It's a very messy arc, in all honesty, with several major storylines going on that don't really seem to connect all that well to each other, and very unsatisfyingly, and one which definitely has aged like milk. The Witch franchise is one that I've always loved, and Lisa Fevrol's recent video deep diving into it has reignited my interest. Seriously, go watch it. It's great, and her looks slay. And so today, we're gonna dive into the third comic arc, how I feel about it, and how it would potentially work in the world of the TV series if it got adapted. Before we begin, ciao. My name's Thomas, aka The Unicorn of War, and I make reviews, critiques, and video essays of the media that I enjoy. I try to be honest with how media resonates with me personally, all my messy biases and experiences included, and you get to listen to me as I ramble while you run errands, do your commutes, or whatever it is normal people do. If you enjoy the content that I make and want to support me and the channel, you can pledge your support over on Patreon, where you will have access to the private Union of War Discord server, as well as early access videos and scripts, and Patreon exclusive videos, and maybe some scripts of a potential Witch Season 3 that I'm currently writing with a friend that may or may not exist, yeah. Mm. Or if you want to contribute without Patreon's commitments, you can give a one-time tip through the thanks button down below. Now, without further ado, let the chaos commence. The original Witch comics carry a darker, more somber tone, with more focus on serialized stories through their arcs, and a much more whimsical, saturated art style. Lisa goes into depth about the creator's style and influences, but suffice to say, I vastly prefer the look of the comics to the show. The comics are just far more unique visually, with more expressive designs and more colorful environments. The show, meanwhile, has a much muddier, earthy palette, I assume to appeal to boys, because the femmes can't have anything without us going, but how do we make it less feminine? Because, you know, feminine things are bad. But the real differences are in the story, 
mostly due to the process of adapting the comic structure to work in an episodic TV series. Things like there not being only 12 portals, but rather random portals appearing through the veil to allow for more storytelling opportunities or fleshing out Meridian as a world with more characters and locales to center episodes around. Plenty of Meridian characters like Blunk, Miranda, The Tracker, Sandpit, and so on don't exist in the comics. They were invented for the show to create more conflicts to fill the 26 episodes, and they were so iconic, they wound up entrenching themselves into witch lore permanently. The girls' powers also work differently. The girls' psychic powers, for example, are available to them from the start of the comics, but are held off in the show until season two to serve as upgrades. When we were in Kandrakar, the council lowered the veil. All the mystic energy that was used to maintain it had to go somewhere, so it flowed back into the heart of Kandrakar and each of our aura mirrors. Will doesn't use lightning in the comics, but rather pink energy, which to me just kind of feels way too generic. My only complaint is that her lightning in the show isn't pink. Like, how dare you? Oh, and of course, <laughs> only Halen can fly in the comics, despite the fact that they all have wings. What the fuck? We've got wings! They can't be wings. If they were wings, when we went like this, we'd... <laughs> Meanwhile... Thank God they changed this in the show. Like, first of all, wings are shorthand visually for flight. Like, what are you, Eternal Sailor Moon? Who do you think has to clean up all the... But also, giving them all flight allows for more dynamic, interesting fight scenes and also helps them navigate the terrain more easily. And you can still have Halen as the Air Guardian be special because she's the best and also the fastest flyer. I fly better than you. Well, actually, chickens fly better than you. Simple, effective, you Nimrod. <laughs> oh, that was mean. I'm keeping it in. <laughs> All in all, I generally prefer the show to the comics. My only major gripes with the show are the more generic, less colorful art style, the weird amount of focus that they put on Caleb in season one, again, I assume to appeal to boys, and the casual sexism that, you know, comes from Caleb. Girls, I need a rope, some kind of weapon, and what do I get? Short redhead with attitude. Hey, I'm a guardian of the veil, buddy. You're just some guy at the bottom of a hole. Like, dude, your world was a matriarchy before Phobos took over however many years ago. What the fuck? But my god, season two is where the show really comes into its own. The second arc in the comics is enjoyable enough, but the show really took its elements and ran with them. Basically, in the comics, Caleb is not human. He's a whisperer, you know, one of those little gossip flowers in Phobos court. He was able to break free and live his own life, only to be killed by Phobos towards the end of the first arc his body transformed into a flower. It's, uh, it's reminding me too much of the end of Wink season four. I feel deeply uncomfortable. This caused Cornelia to spiral, becoming obsessed with bringing Caleb back to life and quitting being a guardian. Through shenanigans involving Luba, the keeper of the Oromirs who really fucking hates the girls in the comics, Cornelia comes to wield all five elements. You know, like in N is for narcissist, you know, that that's where they got it from. What would you do with that? Me. It's Cornelia. <laughs> Except here, Cornelia uses these powers to resurrect Caleb. And in the process, she winds up breaking a seal entombing Nerissa. Nerissa had been sealed away until all five elements inhabited a single entity, which. Uh, OK, then. Um, sure. Uh, well, yeah, all right. I, it, it seems arbitrary, but OK. It's giving when the planets align. But wait, why does this happen when the planets align? Because I said so, it looks dramatic. But anyway, that's how Nerissa breaks free and begins wreaking havoc in the Guardian's lives. And immediately, to me, it makes her feel way less interesting than in the show, where she had already escaped her prison and was living and hiding on Meridian, plotting and scheming for ages and even posing as different characters for ages. This woman was living not double lives, triple lives. The real Trill gave me that. Where is she? There is no Trill. There never was. I have served you as I served Phobos and the Rebellion in humility, waiting for this day. Good for her. So Nerissa's plot is not to gain various mystic hearts in the comics to accrue power, because actually there are no mystic hearts of all the worlds. So, you know, all the intrigue that comes from her finding ways to snatch them up with 
without being able to take them by force, uh, th those are gone. Instead, Nerissa's one and only goal is getting revenge on Kandrakar. Sure, Nerissa in the show wants revenge too, but she's also delusional in her thinking her way is the only way. She believes that she will bring peace and order to the universe, but that is through an authoritarian rule where she and only she has all the power, driving her to the point of killing, manipulating, you know, just generally ruining lives, ruining everyone's day. Only I have the vision to create a perfect universe. All worlds will be united under my rule. No more war or conflict, no injustice or suffering. If I demand obedience, it is only for the greater good. Comic Nerissa, by contrast, is not at all a schemer in the same way, which for me personally kills most of the appeal that she had in the show. So Nerissa creates the Knights of Vengeance, which you'll recognize as the Knights of Destruction from the show, Ember, Tridart, Kor, and Shagon. Side note, Matt is not Shagon here in the comics, and Mr. Huggles is not Kor. Instead, comic Shagon and Kor are some random scientist who uncovered Nerissa's tomb at the wrong time, and Kor is his dog. Okay, um, who are you people? Who are you people? Immediately way less emotionally compelling and takes away Nerissa, ruining the Guardian's personal lives in the show. So Nerissa invades the Guardian's dreams to destroy their mental states, which I do enjoy. It's a more insidious version of what she does in the show, forcing them to try and stay awake to the point of exhaustion, all the while they try and investigate who Nerissa is. Nerissa manages to trick Will into giving her the heart of Kandrakar by disguising herself as Matt, and then uses it to fill Kandrakar with... darkness? Da darkness? It, it looks kind of like ink, but I'm like, no, it wouldn't be ink, because ink is a thing in the... The fifth arc with the, the Book of Elements, I... Whatever. I... It, tar. It, she's filling it with tar. The Guardians manage to stop Nerissa and... Uh, yeah, that, that's it. Arc's over. Go home, kids. It's kind of obvious why the show changed so much of this. They made Nerissa a far more complex, compelling, threatening villain. And they gave her several arcs through Season 2 for different stages of her plan. The Knights of Vengeance arc to tie up loose ends on Meridian while she is manipulating Elyon. The Knights of Destruction arc to focus on building up Nerissa herself as a threat as she gathers the old Guardians and gets another Mystic Heart to even further her power. And then the final arc with all the plot twists bringing Phobos and Cedric back into the mix. They even kept Talonor alive in the show, making her a member of the Council of Kandrakar compared to her having passed away in the comics while Cadma, who was living on Earth in retirement in the comics, instead rules the show exclusive world of Zambala. The show continually expands upon the universe in order to tell a more dynamic, compelling story. And season two also deals in themes to do with power and permission. Characters like Darissa, Cadma, Phobos, and Cedric, who are obsessed with accruing power at any cost, or just because they think they're the best people to wield it, contrasted against our protagonist, who are focused on distributing power and protecting the powerless. It is a natural evolution of season one's story, forcing the girls into higher stakes situations that now encroach further upon their ordinary lives. So with how different the show and the comics are, I thoroughly believe that they would have a field day with everything going on in the third comic arc. Thank God, because uh, <laughs> while I find the elements of this third arc interesting, the execution leaves a lot to be desired. So now with that out of the way, we are going to delve into each major storyline from the third comic arc one by one. The first of which being the arc where Mr. Riddle and Raphael Silla, those dudes from Z is for Zenith, try to expose the Guardian's magic to the people of Earth. So Scylla is the henchman while Riddle is the mastermind. Cause I'm a mastermind. K kinda? K a, a little bit, kinda. Theodore Riddle is a psychic detective who works for... The, the government, a government agency. It's not, it's not exactly all that clear, but basically it's this group of people who investigate paranormal activity with Riddle himself possessing several psychic abilities like mind reading. No, I don't know why he just kind of has it. I, there's, I, look, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't have the answer for this, which I, I guess maybe is fine. Earth is a non-magical world, yet there are a few traces of magic here and there 
in the show. We've got Lillian as the heart of Earth and in the comics, it's, you know, water shadows, uh, basically water people. You know, they only exist for like one issue. No, they don't have anything to do with the rest of the arc. But like the fact that Riddle just has psychic powers and there's no real reason for it. We don't even know anything about this man. I'm like, this, I, it's so lazy and boring. I don't like it. What kind of secrets do you have under that bald skull, sir? Bald, 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 bald. Anyhow, this agency's goal is to investigate the girls and uncover their magical secrets, with Scylla becoming a teacher at Sheffield Institute to keep tabs on them. It's fine, I guess. It's not all that compelling, honestly, because you know, we don't really understand Scylla and Riddle as antagonists. They're doing all this for, for what? For what reason? For why? Who who are they? I who, Do they even go here? Like, what? Are they gay lovers? Like, what, what's, what's the deal? And then there are these other figures involved with their agency, like this Nora lady who is like cold. I get like she's she gives people the cold shoulders, the white hair. They make a joke about like her being a freezer like i a bitch i don't know and then there's this other guy whose name i can't fucking remember i couldn't even be bothered to memorize it because he, that's how much of a non-character he is oh uh we've also got the detectives from cs for changes no i don't remember their names i know one of them is like mcteenan that's all i've got these are detectives medina and mcteenan they'd like to ask you a few questions about elion brown and her parents like real talk i don't care about all the interdepartmental conflicts going on the only departments i care about are the tortured poets department oh my god i'm gonna die when that drops oh my god but like i don't care about any of these characters there's so much conflict between them all but it's not for any like concern over ethics or philosophical approaches or like different goals that they have you know for what they want to do with the girl's magic it's just who shall expose magic to the world first? Who's gonna be the one to do it? And I'm like, I don't care. I hope you all die. Well, you all have a lovely day and I hope you all pass away. During this arc, Tarani, Cornelia, and Halen go on an exchange trip to Redstone Academy. No, it doesn't matter. During which Tarani's power over fire is discovered by Scylla when he goes after Halen's astral drop. Side note, during this, Halen's astral drop is kind of rebelling. She doesn't want to be called Halen because, you know, she doesn't want to be referred to like she's the original. Uh, put a pin in that. Later on, Will uses an astral drop to escape Mr. Riddle, who then kidnaps the astral drop with his mind control powers. Don't, don't ask. The girls fail to save her, which then results in a conflict when Riddle goes to examine her and is confronted by Scylla and the detectives, who basically fight over who's gonna get to dissect her. Yeah! The girls don't step in to save the day, nor does Astra Will save herself. Instead, the Oracle just intervenes himself. He just uses a spell to erase all of their memories. The problem is solved. I hate it. It's an aggressive deus ex machina that prevents the girls from having to step in to solve the problem themselves. The Oracle just hand waves it away. I'm assuming this is because it was used against him in the next story arc, but like, I, <sighs> setup is one thing, but if you're using setup as a way to get out of telling a compelling story right this second, you're, that, that's not what the setup is for. You failed, you have failed at your job. And it's so weird too, because the last thing the Guardians do proactively in this bit of story is fail to save Astral Will, and they're also dealing with armed soldiers? Riddle just has armed soldiers. I, okay, sure, whatever, I don't care. The only real benefit here with the astral drop stuff is that it leads us into our next story of the arc. So in both the comics and the show, the girls are able to use the heart of Kandrakar to create astral drops, clones which can cover for them on Earth while they go to do guardian things. These are your astral drop doubles. When you repeat their name again, but four words, they will disappear. They're identical to you. In the show, there are lifeless mimics who are quite goofy. You say, Sfort Lartsa to create them, and then when you're done, you say astral drop, and then they go back into the heart, bing, bong, boom, you're done. They aren't truly living things, simple tools to be discarded once they've served their purpose and they don't give a shit. They do serve a practical purpose. And I can see this being very useful for each generation of guardians considering they all seem to be from Earth. 
you know, they come in real handy, but there is a risk to using them. Not a big risk, but you know, a fun, goofy risk because they're very stupid and they're very likely to do stupid shit. So the four dragons brought rain to the people. No, the fake confetti rain, I... <laughs> It's very amusing. During season two, we see that when exposed to quintessence, the fifth element which gives life to inanimate objects through lightning, astral drops become altar mirrors, living things with access to the original's memories, emotions, and powers. You are no longer an astral drop, no longer a soulless slave to the bearer of the heart of Kandrakar. You are now a living, feeling altar mirror. <sighs> with all of Will's memories, emotions, and powers. Nerissa turns Will's astral drop into an altar mirror, trying to use her fear of being reabsorbed to make her replace the original Will. Naturally, when Will finds you, she'll reabsorb you into the heart, ending your existence. Unless, of course, you were to replace Will permanently. I shout out to Narissa, ultimate schemer, ultimate manipulator, girl boss, gate light, gas key. I girl, what? Gas lightning more like. And later on, Narissa creates an altar mirror of Yan Lin, which will serve her when she reforms the old guardians. We'll just hide you away and create someone more. Accommodating. It allows for more nuanced, interesting stories where these clones, once considered to be non-living, unfeeling objects, are now their own people. In the comics, meanwhile, that's not how it goes. Astral Drops kind of just are living things from Jump, which makes me wonder why the Heart and Kandrakar would just give the Guardians this horrible power to begin with. That just seems like a really terrible abuse of power to be given each generation of your Guardians. Like, what the fuck is wrong with y'all? Like, it makes more sense to me that Kandrakar would design these to be non-living things that are not going to be harmed and then having a freak accident go wrong to give them sentience. That makes more sense to me than this where I'm like, OK, so like have all Guardians had problems with their astral drops like this, like just from jump? Like, what the fuck? So anyhow, the girls astral drops rebel against them. They don't want to be reabsorbed and sent back into oblivion. And they're also pissed with how the girls kind of just treat them as disposable. Astral Will specifically is really upset that she was just basically thrown to the wolves, thrown away so that Will could get away from Riddle and then Astro Will got kidnapped and stolen by those soldiers and experimented on and then held hostage and fought over. A very traumatizing experience. And then the Oracle saves her, but then he's just like, nah, you're just gonna get go back, go back to your original, go back and rejoin her. And it's, mm, oh, the scowl on Astro Will's face. I'm like, girl, I get it. Ooh. Looks like my summer vacation is over. But in the end, the astral drops of all the guardians are allowed to go off, assume their own identities, and live um, s somewhere on Earth uh, other than Heatherfield. Um, they got them a bus ticket, I guess. I don't know. It, it seems like it'd be pretty easy for them to be exposed as, you know, magical or doppelgangers, especially considering, you know, the girls are only like 14, maybe 15. Like, how are they going to survive? out here on their own, especially because it would allow Riddle and potentially other people like him to expose the Guardians down the road. Did y'all think this through? But that said, I do like that the comics tried to explore this more nuanced story and how they integrated it into the Riddle storyline, especially Astro Will's resentment. But I just prefer how it is in the show. I absolutely love the way that the show handled both Astro Drops and Alter Mirrors. It's handling the themes that the comics are trying to tackle, but doing so in a more competent, reasonable way that still hits the same notes, tackles the same themes, but feels more thought out, better structured. And I really would have loved to see that fear of Astro Drops potentially becoming Alter Mirrors make the girls wary of even using Astro Drops in the first place. And also would be interesting given Yan Lin's Alter Mirror now going as Mira is able to live a normal life as Yan Lin's long lost twin sister. Yan Lin introduced her family to her long lost twin sister, Mira. It really opens the door for what kind of stories you want to tell about agency, autonomy, even identity, which uh, uh, the autonomy thing brings us to our final 
part of the story, oh God. So the third and arguably main story primarily takes place on the fantasy world of Arcanta. We don't know anything about this place, aside from the fact that its people are farmers, and it's also home to banshees who live in swamps, are scary, are evil, and grant wishes. They are evil swamp genie ladies. Okay, we're also saying that they're all evil. Um, I... I, I don't I don't like that. Uh, I really don't like that. OK, all right, great. Now, Arcanta is home to this arc's main antagonist, Ari or Arai. I b bitch, I don't know. I, I'm going to just call him Ari and I'm going to picture him as Jaden Animation's pet bird. I think the hair is actually the same shade as Ari's feathers. So there you go. Ari's wife died in childbirth and his son Maki is nonverbal. He can't speak. And apparently this really upsets Ari, who thinks his son is diseased and I, I am uncomfortable. I, oh my God. Now, if the story called out his belief that his son is inherently broken because he can't speak, that would be fine. It could actually be an exploration of how a lot of parents hold ableist attitudes towards their neurodivergent disabled children. But, uh, it, it does not do that. The story treats Ari not as incorrect for thinking that his son is broken, but as going too far to fix it because the story agrees that something is wrong with Maki and that he needs to be fixed. Give me just half a sec. <laughs> what the fuck? Seen not only in how the Guardians also treat him and how the Oracle speaks about him, but also his finale in this story. Oh, fuck. So to try and fix this, Ari kidnapped a banshee named Yua, using her wishes to give himself a fortress in the Scarlet Citadel making himself the lord of his world and lavishing his son in luxury. But of course, this doesn't make Maki speak because that's not how this fucking works. And so Ari, stupid and upset, uses his last wish to make Yua his permanent slave. The anti-Aladdin, if you will. I'm really not sure why there wasn't a rule to keep someone from doing that in the first place. It's kind of giving the same bullshit with the Astro Drops just being alive from jump. What the fuck? But you know, we didn't really think through the headache of banshee lore or rules, so fuck you. <laughs> Anyhow, Ari then went to the Oracle to, you know, fix his son. Ugh. And the Oracle refused. Not because Ari is a fucking idiot and his son is fine as he is, but because the Oracle states it's not his role. Which, yeah, I, I get him saying his role is to observe from afar and guide the Guardians in protecting the universe rather than fixing individual problems. But again, would love it if the Oracle asserted that Maki being nonverbal is not a problem in the first fucking place. I just, I want to strangle everyone in the Sark. I want to fight them. So Ari is pissed off and he now wants vengeance and declares war on Kandra. What? 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 We, we just did this. It, you know, just last arc, we had Narissa seeking vengeance on Kandrakar and now Ari is too? Do, do we have any other motivations in the bag to give our villains or are we just going to keep repeating this until the end of time? It makes Ari feel redundant and uninteresting and Lord knows his lackluster presence and unaddressed ableism makes him more infuriating and boring than actually threatening. The story then follows the Guardians being ordered by the Oracle to talk down Ari before he goes too far and we continually teleport to Arcanta to deal with him, with Ari using you as powers to attack us. Basically, it is a series of repeated home invasion attempts. Cool. And this just kind of repeats until the story's climax. It gets old very fucking quickly. You know how Phobos and Nerissa in the show would find unique ways to mess with the Guardians or had interesting schemes that served for the plots of individual episodes? You know, great episodes like Ambush of Taurus Filmy, uh, the underwater mines. E is for enemy. Yeah, we, we don't we don't do any of that. Ari refuses to do any of that. It's literally just teleport in. Ari is pissed at us. He fucks with us. We leave. Wash, rinse, repeat. Well, that's not fair. One time we go to a village on Arcanta and then Ari wipes it off the fucking map with a tornado just to kill the guardians. I that's it. That's it. So this story, while interesting conceptually, becomes not only incredibly poor at tackling the sensitive subject matter it is trying to take on, but also deeply horrifically boring, which to me is the worst thing a piece of media can be. Be trash all you want so long as you entertain me, but if you're boring, unforgivable, unforfucking givable. And it's so odd because this arc also explores something similar 
through Tarani. Tarani has been getting headaches more often and finds that her vision has completely been restored, allowing her to see perfectly without her glasses. The Oracle reveals that this is due to the gift of Xinjing, a power which heals the guardians and keeps them in tip top shape so that they can, you know, save the day or whatever. But that also includes Tarani's eyesight and she's pissed. She's upset that the Oracle knew about this and didn't even ask her if this is something that she would want. And this is paired with her being upset with how much being guardians has changed their lives after such a short amount of time. And so Tarani quits being a guardian as a show of protest for part of the arc. While Tarani is right to be upset, it really feels like this is only here to sow conflict between the guardians and the Oracle for the next story arc, rather than actually explore any themes to do with bodily autonomy, agency, and ableism. And that definitely becomes clear to me through how Maki's story is handled. So anyway, Tarani is replaced by a warrior girl named Arube from the Oracle's homeworld of Basiliad. And she's fine. She clashes a lot with the Guardians, but I don't really find her that interesting of a character, especially given the comics as a whole see her not as a major character to join the group, then just another thing to throw into this arc to try and keep the reader's interests. Then again, I guess changing the title to Witch O would be very odd. You know, it's giving when fans name themselves after like the number of people in the group and then when one leaves suddenly you have a fucking brand identity crisis. You know, the Winx Club never had to change their name when they added Aisha because, you know, it was just the Winx Club. But with Witch, if you want a new member, you had to change the fucking acronym and that's a whole nightmare. And I, I hate that. Why did we do this to ourselves? You know, every day that passes by, I find more problems with this name. First, Lisa speaks my mind on how searching this name is just witch with the dots in the middle is terrible SEO. But now this also, like, Jesus Christ. Basically, Arube was only really thrown in here to keep readers' interests, and it, it's not working. Although I do like her design. You know, I, I, like, I like the outfit. I like the sashes, the pink sashes that kind of look like tails. I, th those are cute. I like those. Eventually, Tarani returns, and right on cue, Yue is freed. She kidnaps Maki and takes him to the swamp to get back at Ari. The Guardians team up with Ari to try and save him, and in the process, Maki is injured and nearly dies. The Guardians use the gift of Zinjing to save him, which winds up making him able to speak. Thanks, I fucking hate it. Now, given I'm not disabled, I can't really speak to this much, but generally, you don't want to magically heal characters of their neurodivergence or disability because you're basically saying that they are inherently broken and need to be fixed. Which, uh, yeah, the, the comic views Maki that way. And now Ari has been vindicated for continually thinking of his son as broken. Thanks, I hate it so fucking much. This arc has interesting elements, definitely. Ari using you as power for his own personal gain could make for interesting conflicts with the Guardians, especially given he's arguably doing them not to take over the universe like previous enemies, but is doing them for the sake of his family. If you remove the ableism or, you know, actually unpack it competently, it could definitely work. But the repetitive fights with Ari just are so, so boring. And at one point he like dons this suit of armor to try and fight the girls. It, it, it doesn't make it any more interesting. It's so boring. It's I, the show guardians would wipe the floor with this loser so fast. All of the bland repetitive execution combined with the ableism make this arc a total slog. Ideally the show would have caught on to this and made it less unbearable and maybe flesh out Arcanta. I actually would have really loved to see what the show did with Arcanta. You know, like the way that they fleshed out Meridian. Oh, it would have been great. It would have, it would have ate, it would have ate down. The Banshees specifically needed so much more to work with. If they are such powerful, mysterious, important entities, you would expect them to be more than just generic evil ghost women who live in a nearby swamp and who are all nameless, save for Yua. And dear God, please connect it to the Riddle plot. Have them link into each other. Have their themes connect. Have Riddle maybe stumble upon Arcanta and maybe even free Yua so that they can team up. Just do something. Do something, please. Which is a franchise that, while it has its cult following, feels very much forgotten. While the comics have their appeal, the show arguably remains the definitive version for a lot of folks, casual fans and myself included. It's honestly nice having multiple versions of the same story to choose between. And so I am really sad that we never got to see what the show would have done with this arc. 
given it had such potential and wound up being such a goddamn mess, I would have loved seeing how the show's team adapted it, especially following the gold that was season two. Anyhow, if you enjoyed this video and would like to see more content like this from me, then be sure to subscribe and ring that bell for notifications because YouTube hates creators. Also, please consider pledging your support for myself and the channel over on Patreon. I'm the Unicorn of War, and good lord, Ari's parenting is a goddamn shit show.